Hi guys, in this video, part two of graphical summaries of data, we're going to focus on numerical variables. Okay, so in this case, we're dealing again with univariate data. So that means we're analyzing one variable at a time. So the ver uh, graphical summaries that I want to discuss in this video, actually the one I want to focus on primarily is the histogram. I do mention the dot plot and the box plot. I think the histogram and the dot plot have a lot of overlap and I think I want to focus on the histogram. So I'm not going to discuss the dot plot too much or if at all. And the box plot I'd love to discuss. It's in another it's another important plot, but we need some more background material as far as numerical summaries of data before we can uh, adequately discuss the box plot. So with no further ado, the rest of this video is going to heavily focus on the histogram. Okay. So here's some high level kind of bullets on the histogram. The histogram shows the distribution of values in the data. Remember, we're talking about a numerical variable here. So we want to see how is that variable distributed? How are the values of this data that you've collected distributed? Are they all on the left side of a, of a range of values? Are they all on the upper end of a range of values? Are they spread evenly between a, a, a maximum and a minimum? And every other possibly possibility in between. We will be able to see this with a histogram. Okay, So the distributions can be broken down into talking about center or centers, spread or variability, the shape, any gap or gaps, outliers perhaps, okay? So distributions, can you can break them down into these kind of uh, smaller items. The x-axis of a histogram is where you're going to see class intervals or bins. What these are, what these bins are, are kind of artificially created with some thought, okay? Values ranges of values that we then can use to count up how many observations fall into each. When we get to an example, it'll be much clearer. Okay? The y-axis of a histogram is going to typically be either frequency, relative frequency histograms, or density histogram. So on the y-axis, we have one of these three. And you should always uh, take note of what's on the y-axis because that determines the type of histogram you're working with. Okay? Soon when we see one of these histograms in the next couple slides, you're going to get a much clearer idea of these things. But let me just go through these last two bullets. A rough guide on how histograms are created, although I rarely ask anyone to create a histogram more to interpret them is first off you take the sample size and you take about the square root of the sample size and use that as a rough estimate of how many of these bins you're going to create. Okay? Um, and you have to make sure that you are inclusive towards the minimum and the maximum values in your um, data set. Because uh, you don't want to exclude any values from the histogram. Now, in a frequency, in a relative frequency histogram, the bins that we're, we keep talking about, which we're going to see in a moment, they have to have the same width. So if you choose a width of 5, they all have to be, have a width of 5. If you choose a width of 10, they all have to be 10, etc. But a density histogram allows you to break this rule and be more flexible. And that's why sometimes it's preferred over the other two. Okay, and we're going to see examples of all of these. So, uh, with no further ado, here's an example of a frequency histogram. So, I, I gave an exam many years ago, and after grading the exam, by the way, there were 100 students, so I had N of 100. I recorded all the grades, and I wanted to get a better idea of how my class did. So instead of looking at just what the average of the class was, or what the best grade was, or what the worst grade was, I wanted to create a graphical summary that shows me the distribution of all the grades in my class. 
So uh, I give you some basic information here. I don't give you the entire data set just for uh, uh, brevity purposes, but the lowest score was a 30, the highest score was a 98. And then I created this frequency distribution table. First off, here we go. We get to see what these bins are. So since the minimum grade was a 30, I started my bin at 30. And this is a left close bracket so that means if I had a 30 which I did that would be included in this and this is right open okay so this is a little more technical as far as uh, some of your math backgrounds you may or may not have seen this but generally this is a closed this is a open okay so if I had a 40 here it would not fall into this bin but rather into this bin Okay, because this is left closed. Now, um, moving along, so I create these bins. Uh, I chose a bin width of 10, so I got from 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, all the way on up to include my maximum, which was 98, so I went from 90 to 100. My bins are nice, clean numbers. You don't always have to have these nice, clean numbers. Your bins could have started at 29.73, for example. Um, as long as the bin widths are the same, you're not breaking any rules when, with the frequency histogram. After I created these bins, I went through my data set and I, with the help of software, I counted how many of the 100 exams were between 30 and 40, and there was only one. This is this column, frequency. 40 to 50, there was only one so on and so forth for example 80 to 90 had the highest frequency of all these bins they were 46 if you sum up this column you should get 100 or else you missed something i then go ahead taking these two columns and create a histogram a frequency histogram you could see the x-axis has the bins and the y-axis is frequency and the height of these bars are equivalent to the frequencies from the frequency distribution table with the highest bar being at 80 to 90 right um, notice there are no gaps if there is a gap between a bar here it means something it means there were no values in that range as opposed to a bar chart where the x-axis does not have order so there could or could not be gaps and they wouldn't mean anything here there is order and if you see a gap it means there was zero frequency in that range okay so take note of that now let's take a look at this on a more um, an analytic level looking at this histogram I see that there is a general shape like this to it if I were to draw, summarize it with a curve this shape we have a name for and at the end of this video I'm going to talk more about different shapes and names of those shapes this is example of a left or negative skewed distribution why because we have a long left tail and a almost non-existent right tail Okay, so that is left or negative skewed. What does that mean though? It means that most, as you can see, most of the values of these hundred values are piling up in this area here on the upper end of the range and very few are in the lower end. That's why I get this very low bars here and then quick climb up and a concentration around somewhere in the 80 to 90 range okay I would call this a peak and I would also call this a center of the distribution there's clearly variability we even describe the variability in a more subtle way by talking about the skewness okay moving along more to talk more to say about that in the uh, subsequent examples uh, before we go forward you'll also notice I made a relative frequency column um, just like I did in uh, part one of these graphical summaries videos here I take the frequencies and divide by n so I get proportions here so instead of the frequencies I could have plotted relative frequencies and I would have had to change these axis but it would look exactly the same so the difference between the frequency and relative frequency histogram 
is, as far as visual inspection, would be nothing. It would be exactly the same. Okay, um, only in ter relative frequency, you could you could argue is slightly more um, informative because it's not just telling you frequency, but it's telling you relatively the f relative frequency. Because one could be a very little amount or a larger amount. It turns out it's just one percent in this case, and that's more informative than just knowing there was one. Okay, so very little difference between those two. Now I want to make a case for the more um, sophisticated version of the histogram called a density histogram. So to do this I make a little visual and this is actually an example of a dot plot which I don't want to really talk about too much other than use it as an example to to uh, make a case for a density histogram. So let's first read this. When most of your data is concentrated at a center with few unusually large and or unusually small values you would maybe want to consider making a hist density histogram. Why? Because if you were to plot these points and just stack them up on uh, just a regular number line, you can clearly see there's a concentration here somewhere between 30 and 32. There's a center, there's a gravity there. Okay? And then there's just almost no values. Well, there are literally no values until 40. You have one value up here. Then you have some sparse values down here from 28 to 16. A very large range, right, of 12 has only four observations with huge gaps as well. In this case, we would be falling into this kind of situation as defined by that bullet. If we were to choose bin widths that were very large, we wouldn't have gaps. So we might end up with something like this. Yes, notice I'm uh, trying to make these bin widths the same width because uh, that if I were to create a frequency or relative frequency histogram, I am restricted to same bin widths. I end up with no gaps. We don't really love gaps, but um, I lose a lot of information here because I don't get to see this. All I see is this big bar, which tells me there's a lot of data uh, observations from, from here to here but I don't get to see the details of what's going on underneath this big bar. Okay, but I do solve the problem of having these gaps. Now, let me go the other way and show you the problem of the gaps. What if I want all the details here? So I go very small bin widths and I end up with something like this. I have gaps, 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 gaps. I got a bar here, bar here, bar here, bar here. I chose very narrow bins, right? Because I get to choose as the creator but they have to be the same width if I'm doing frequency or relative frequency. So this is great because I get to see all the detail, high resolution of what's going on in the center, much more informative than the previous histogram I just drew up here. But then I got these huge gaps here, which are very unsightly and don't really help me out a lot other than to tell me that there isn't much data out here. Well, what if I could combine large bins with small bins and end up with something like this? So where there isn't much data, I have a nice large bin. And then I can play around with the sizes. When I get to areas where there is much more data, I can lower the bin and get more concentration of values. End up with something like this, eliminating unsightly gaps, at, while at, at the same time, in areas where there is a lot of data and there's a lot to learn from, I have higher resolution, i.e. narrower bins. Well, a density histogram allows me to do this. How, but, but there is this one caveat, and that is we have to deal with this more abstract concept of density. And so density in the context of histograms is equal to the proportion relative frequency, right, same thing, divided by the bin width. So if your bin width is allowed to change, right, with the density histogram, you must take that into account. So when you, in order to get density and to make this a density histogram, you must not only be cognizant of the proportion, but also of the width, okay? Let's do an example of this with real numbers. Now, going back to this, I just want to make an argument. If 
I were to force or someone were to force me to take some of these bins and um, combine them. Someone said, what's the best choice of bins to combine? I would argue, and I hope you would agree, that these two would be the best to combine. Why? First off, they have to be next to each other to combine them. You can't combine a bin that's here and here. Okay? And why these two? Because they have such low frequency. So if you were to force me, this would be clearly the correct choice as the best choice to collapse. So I could maybe collapse these to 30 to 50, make it 20 wide, and then the frequency would be 2 as opposed to 1 in each, right? Because I could just add them up. And here I could end up having one bar instead of these two bars here. But now I'm in the realm of density and I'm no longer can deal with frequency or relative frequency. Now another argument I want to make, what if I were to force you to split one of these bins? What's the best choice to split? I think it's easy to see that this is the best bin to split. Why? Because it's got the most data. This bin right here has the most data, so there's the most information in there, okay? So um, you want to see the details, more details in there because there is details. There's 46 observations from 80 to 90. I want to know, are they all on this side? Are they all on this side? Are they in the middle there? Are they spread evenly? What's the story? let me see so if i could i would love to split this into maybe two or three bins now with the data that i've given you or not given you you can't do that because you don't know where these 46 fall but if i had the data set like you usually would if you were creator creator of a histogram you would be able to create uh, smaller bins in this and this would but what I wanted to um, make a case for is that this would be the best choice to split the second best choice would be this okay so let's go now see what I did you could see I have the bins and the frequencies and the relative frequencies ignore that last column for a second you see I've combined the 30 to 40 and 40 to 50 as I said I would I left the 50 60 60 70 alone I split the 70 to 80 into 70, 75, 75, 80. I also split the 80 to 90 into 80, 80, 85, 85, 90. Those were the two best choices, this one being the best and that one being the second. And I see I got new frequencies here. You could see this adds up to 25 as it should and this adds up to 46 as it should. And I left the 90 to 100 alone. And these frequencies will still add up to 100, they must. These bins are all different sizes, 20, 10, 10, 5, 5, 5, 5, 10. That's okay, so long as I don't try to create a histogram from either these two columns. But I need these two columns in order to get density. And how do I compute density? Proportion, or relative frequency, over bin width. So here's my proportions. I take the proportion, I divide it by the bin width, which is 20 in this case, so 0.02 over 20. Boom! My density is 0 0.001. Do not ever convert that to a percentage. That is a density. It's a more abstract notion than, than proportion. Okay? So just look at it as it is. There's a lower density there. Okay? Next, proportion, 0 0.02, den uh, width, 10. So 0 0.02 over 10, 0 0.002. All the way on down to, let's just do one more example, this bin. Proportion, 19% between 85 and 90. There is width of 5, so 19.19 over 5, 0.038. Then I take these guys and I plot them and I make sure that I have density on the y-axis. And obviously the values of density are appropriate here. I have my bins down here. And now look, I have a nice wide bin of 20 here, bin of 10, 10, 5, 5, 5. Where there was a lot of data, I created smaller bins so I get more details. Isn't this, isn't this a nicer, more detailed picture of what's going on than this? This was already nice. This is even better. I get more detail on what's going on 
where there is a lot of data, I don't lose anything out here where there wasn't much going on, especially out down here. I still see that this is left skewed. There is one peak. There is the center of data is here, et cetera, et cetera. OK, good. Now moving along, um, ask you some questions here so you could pause this and work on this. OK. So once you've got that, give the, give these these problems a chance, uh, a, 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 a shot. Uh, what I'm interested in mostly for my courses is, is that you can take a density histogram like this and answer questions from it. So since you know density equals proportion or relative frequency over the bin width. If I ask you a question like, what proportion of students scored below 60? You go to 60, and you're interested in below 60, and you're interested in the proportion, OK? So if you work through this, you have the density, right? If you can't read that, I provided this table here. So you know the density is 0.02 right there, 0.002 rather. And you have the width. And then you have the width here, and you have the density. OK? 0.001. Now you are literally going to rework this formula and solve for proportion, because that's what I'm asking for. And I'm asking for proportion in the next question as well. If you look at it geometrically, proportion in a density histogram, listen carefully, in a density histogram, proportion whether you saw it through the formula or you realize this visually, proportion is equal to the area. So you have to see what, what range you're interested in. So below 60. So I'm going to shade the area of the histogram below 60. If I can get this area and add it to this area, I will answer this question. OK? What proportion scored above 80? Same thing. Here's 80. Get the area of this bar, add it to the area of this bar, add it to the area of this bar. How do you get the area of a rectangle? Base times height. What's the height? Density. What's the base? Bin width. Isn't that what the formula says? Density equals proportion over bin width. So if I have density, I can multiply it by width and get proportion. OK, so give these questions a shot. They're definitely doable. And then finally, what's the total area under the density histogram? Well, think about this, right? Total area under density histogram has to be 100 or 100% or 1. OK, because if you add up this bin to 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 this to this, it must equal 1 because all the data must be represented in the histogram. OK? And since area is equal to proportion, the total proportion has to be 100% or 1. OK? Um, the answers to these two questions are easily um, seen if we go back and cheat a little. So what proportion is less than 60? Add up these three. Right? So 4%. So that's the answer. What percent was greater than 80 or students scored greater than 80? Add up these guys. So what do we have 60, 75, uh, 85%, right? Uh, 14 is uh, 60 and then 85. Okay. And then add all these up. So we had 4, 85, that's 89 plus 11, 1 or 100%. That's the answer to our third question. Okay. All right, so that's how you interpret a histogram. So you should always be able to look at a histogram, identify what type of histogram you're dealing with, and based on that, answer very basic questions on it, as, a, as well as shapes and things like this. OK? Finally, I want to take a step back and talk about histograms in a much more high level way, OK? And how they reflect different distribution characteristics. So let's have this thought experiment together. 
let's imagine n is very large. So n gets big, 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 big. It was uh, in our example, it was 100. Imagine it goes to 1,000. Imagine it goes to 10,000, etc. What is that going to allow us to do? We're going to have higher frequencies at each in each bin, right? The range is not going to change much in a given set of data, but the frequencies in each of the bins are going to increase, which is going to allow us to use smaller and smaller or narrower or narrower bins. Narrower and narrower bins allow because we have more data, which it allows us to get a higher resolution histogram, something like this picture here. So here's a density histogram where I had a lot of clearly had a lot of data. So look at how many little bins I had and how much more smooth it looks than the histograms that we created uh, in the previous two examples. When I have a histogram like this, I can sometimes just forget about all this noise, just jagged up noise, and pay attention to what we'll call the signal the real pattern that's going on, which is which can be summarized with a single swoop of a line, a curve. Okay? We'll sometimes call that a density curve. Okay? And this will also help us because we'll come back to this idea later in the semester when we deal with density uh, probability density functions. Okay? But for now, I'm gonna be able to now draw curves of this shape and this shape and this shape of any shape and you know that underneath these curves there was theoretically a bunch of bars holding them up before I could draw this curves okay and you know exactly what I'm talking about okay so let's discuss a few characteristic shapes and terms so distribution characteristics and this is like anatomy and also terminology that is useful to uh, discuss um, histograms, all right, uh, and also their distribution, which is ultimately why we use histograms, uh, what we use histograms to learn. So a histogram you can think of very generally having a tail or tails and a body, okay? So we've seen, for example, uh, actually let me just draw some here. I'm going to draw some examples of very characteristic histograms. So here's a left skewed or negatively skewed histogram. Here's a right skewed histogram. Here's a bell shape, looks like a bell, right, profile. Here's a uniform histogram. Um, and you can have uh, histograms that look like this, that have two peaks, three peaks, etc. Okay? Um, so tails, I would call this a tail. I would call this a tail. I would call this a tail. This is a very, I would say, a very short tail. Okay, here we have a very exaggerated right tail. Here there's no real tail to speak of. Here we have two tails. You can't have three tails when you're dealing with univariate data. The body, I would call this the body of these histograms, okay? Of these density curves, if you like, okay? Here the body is the entire thing. Okay, so they're just a general way to refer to uh, general parts of a histogram. A mode or modes are peaks. So here we have a peak. That's one peak. We call it unimodal. Unimodal. Bimodal. You could have trimodal, multi multimodal distributions. We won't deal with those this semester. Those are more advanced topics. We'll, we'll only be dealing with unimodal distributions. Unimodal. And here in this case you could say this has one mode, but no one would really argue that. Symmetricity or skewness. Well, here we go. We call this negative skewed. We call this positive skewed. The long tail is the direction of the skew. Here, we have a much more uniform distribution, right? Uniform distribution. Okay, and we're not going to worry too much about this one anymore because we're not dealing with this type of distribution. So you can have asymmetric distributions that are skewed. You can have symmetric distributions that are not skewed. And then there are specific distributions that show up so often in our study of statistics that we've given them names. And this semester you're going to come across, in any introductory or intermediate stat course, you're going to come across a few very important distributions. And I'm just going to drop some names right now, just because to foreshadow things that you're going to see later down the line.
There are things like the normal distribution, which happens to look bell-shaped. There are There's a distribution called the T or student's distribution, which actually also is bell-shaped. There are there's a distribution called the chi-square distribution and the F distribution. Both of those are examples of right skewed distributions, generally speaking. Okay, so there are certain distributions that show up so often, and we use them so much in the study of statistics that they have their own name. Okay, so uh, here. Uh, so this is the conclusion of graphical summaries of data, univariate data. Make sure you also have watched part one in this two-part series. And um, uh, look out for uh, subsequent lectures where occasionally you'll see some plots and graphs that are appropriate once we have some more background information. For example, the box plot. Okay, so till next time, have a great day. And uh, be sure to like, subscribe, and share.